Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the word of God. Now Adam knew his wife Eve. She conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, East of Eden, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahajael, and Mahajael fathered Methusael, and Methusael fathered Lamech. And Lamech had two wives. The name of the one was Adar, and the name of the other Zillah. Adar bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Adar and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, also was, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, unveil your truth to us. We are in darkness unless you bring the light. May the entrance of your word bring that light. In Jesus' name, amen. In Spain, back in 1984, uh, Avianca jet crashed into the side of a mountain. As is usual when such a tragedy occurs, an investigation takes place to determine the cause. Soon after the investigation was launched, a very haunting discovery was made. The black box, which as you know, records much of the elements of what takes place in a flight, when it was found, there was a record of the dialogue of the pilots and the controllers. And it revealed things that happened several minutes before the final impact. A computerized voice from the plane's automatic warning system told the crew repeatedly in English, 
pull up, pull up, pull up. And the pilot, for no apparent reason, shouted, shut up, gringo, and switched the system off. Minutes later, the plane smashed into the side of a mountain and everybody on board was killed, all perished. What a tragedy. It's a desperately sad story and one that I believe signifies the way many people live in our day in the 21st century when the warning messages of conscience are telling us, pull up, pull up, stop, stop, pull up. We try to switch those warning messages off. Do we listen? Is the voice loud in our minds or is it getting softer and softer as the years progress, as we continue on our way. It's quite a thought, isn't it? The conscience is a God-sent blessing. It's built into the fabric of every human soul. It's a warning system given by God. The conscience is a warning system. It's an alarm system for the soul. When we think of the word conscience, it comes in two forms, two Words put together in the English language, con, that means with, and science, that means knowledge. And so conscience means with knowledge. God has given us knowledge, and we're with it. We have it. It's our possession. It's God's internal alarm system, as I say, for the human soul. Properly understood, it's a wonderful tool. It is never infallible, but it is not negligible. We should never violate the conscience. You remember the great speech of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, 1521, I believe was the year, when he said, unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I will not recant. And he went on to say, to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. You and I should never violate our conscience. But unlike scripture, the Conscience is not an infallible guide. It needs to be trained. Our senses need to be trained, Hebrews chapter 5 tells us. Trained to discern good and evil. Some people have no conscience when God says, don't do that, that's not for you, that's not what I command. In fact, there's a, there, there's a word against it. I say, don't do that. And some people go ahead and have no conscience about it. Our consciences need to be trained. Others, on the other hand, uh, are the exact opposite. They feel guilt when they should not feel guilt. Scripture reveals to us in Romans chapter 14 of the, the weaker brother and by definition the stronger brother regarding the eating of meat. Our senses, our conscience needs to be trained by the word of God. Not by society, not by culture, not where we grow up, but by what the Word of God says. If God says it, that settles it. But some people who don't feel guilt should feel guilt. And others who are feeling guilt shouldn't feel guilt. We all need to be trained by the Word of God. Scripture testifies that the conscience, in fact, can be seared. We can so ignore the voice of conscience that it no longer makes any noises. It no longer says pull up, pull up, or stop, stop. We hear it less and less because we give in to sin so readily. That should be a horrendous warning. Should we at one time known things were wrong and then we violate our conscience so we no longer hear conscience again. That is a seared conscience. Romans 1 speaks of the seared conscience in the sense of God giving people over to the sin that they crave. And without God's intervention at that moment, all's over. Sin leads to judgment. We all know that, that's true. But judgment is meted out in that God only, not only judges for sin, but he gives us over to the sin we crave, which itself is a judgment. He gives us to the sin we crave for. What's true for a city, for a nation, it's also true of a church. It's true of us as individuals. The wisdom of our time says that we are to avoid, we should avoid, all feelings of guilt. Many other counselors out there who'll tell you guilt is a bad thing. 
It's a harmful thing. You need to switch that alarm system off. And that's foundational to most of the psychiatry and psychology out there. But is that correct? No, I believe counseling, when it's biblical, starts with what God says and acknowledges sin when it is sin, but then goes to God for the forgiveness of sin. The Bible allows us to do both. Look sin squarely in the face, confess it as sin, and go to God with that confession rather than hiding, rather than avoiding. In Genesis chapter 4, we see a man whose conscience is hounding him. And rightly so. He's a murderer at this point. We're reading of the first murder in our Bibles. Straight after Genesis 3 comes Genesis 4, and there it is. Fratricide, the killing of a brother. The man is Cain, and the situation we're reading of is the aftermath of a murder. Cain has murdered his brother Abel. Read in verse 5, so Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? When God asks a question, it's not because he's in need of information. He knows the information. He wanted Cain to admit what was going on in his heart. And Cain had no right to be angry. But in his twisted, perverted thinking, which was his reality, he was sad and he was angry. His face was fallen. Cain had no right to that anger. But God began to ask him questions, as we saw last time. This questioning of Cain was itself a mercy. Cain's issue was Cain. We are each to admit our own sin rather than point at the sin of others. Admit our sin, then repent and believe. Psalm 139 spells it out very well when the psalmist wrote, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Two paths were available to Cain. If you read verse 7, God said, If you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, do the right thing. Do well in God's sight. Come to me, in other words, even now with repentance and with a blood sacrifice. You remember he didn't do that. The way God had commanded him and his brother to come to him. And if you do what is well, will you not be accepted? Will not your countenance be lifted up? And the implication is, yes, it will. Romans 15, 13 tells us there's all joy and peace in believing. Cain, believe me now. Believe me as... Uh, those around you have, as Abel has, believe me. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you. It's to master you, but you've got to master it. Option number two was do not do well. Instead, you stiffen your neck and you refuse to humble yourself and sin gains further footholds. That's exactly what happened. Cain chose the latter Motivated, I'm sure, by jealousy because his brother's sacrifice was accepted and he was not, his was not. And by rage, no doubt, he murdered his brother. Verse 8, Cain spoke to his brother Abel and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Sin now had mastered Cain, fulfilling in brief the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, the seed of the serpent and its hostility to the seed of the woman. The big picture here is the devil's behind all of this. He was the instigator here. We read in John chapter 8, Jesus spoke these words to real people. You are of your father, the devil. Now hear what he says. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He's right there behind the scenes. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he's a liar and the father of lies. Isn't that interesting? Cain murdered and then he lied just as the devil's nature surely is. Cain's nature was the devil's nature. Look at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? In other words, even now... I'm giving you the chance. Confess your sin. Mercy is available. Mercy is available. But he confounds and even multiplies his sin. His reaction was, I don't know. I don't know where he is. Cain had murdered his brother. Now he's lying about it. 
Of course he knew. This was a lie. I do not know. Lie? That's a lie. Then he said, am I my brother's keeper? Actually, yes, he is. Verse 10, and the Lord said, what have you done? Again, God is not asking this to find out information. He knows exactly what has been done. And he spells it out. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Instead of a blood sacrifice, which is what I commanded, you've now slayed your brother. Now his blood cries out against you. Two voices are in play here. God speaking to Cain and Abel's blood speaking, crying out from the ground. Hebrews 12, 24 puts it this way, contrasting Jesus' blood with Abel's. We come now to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to sprinkle blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. It's interesting, that's New Testament. Cain's blood cries out for vengeance. Jesus' blood cries out for mercy. Have you come to Jesus by means of the blood shed on the cross? Now, judgment comes to Cain and a curse is pronounced. But before we move on, I want to ask you something. Do you believe in a God who can bless and a God who can curse? I think in America, we believe in a God who blesses. God bless America. I remember in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, we would see everywhere, God bless America. I put a sign up, America bless God. Why would God bless America? A land filled with violence, defiance of him, abortion, over 62 million Little babies aborted in our nation. Why would God bless? Give me a reason why God would bless America. But many don't believe that he can bless. Many do. And they ask for God's blessing. The great song, God bless America. But how many can believe that God can curse as well as bless? There's great value in a blessing. If God blesses your life, you're going to be blessed. But if God restrains the hand of blessing and you're under his curse, it's not going to go well. One of the features of our service is the end of the service. And for me as a teenager, when I went to church, if at all, before I was converted, the best part of the service was the benediction. I knew everything was over then. We're out of here. But think of the word benediction. Bene means good. Diction means words. You have a dictionary filled with words and the meaning of words. Benediction means good word. And in the benediction, God is blessing people. The great Aaronic, A-A-R-O-N, relating to Aaron, Aaronic blessing of the book of Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 is, the Lord bless you. Do you believe there's power in that? I do. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. There's power in blessing. If God blesses you, you're going to be blessed. You start a company, it's going to be blessed. You enter into marriage, it's going to be blessed. You enter into a new position in your company, you're going to be blessed. When the blessing of God is on you, the blessing of the Lord makes rich and he adds no sorrow with it, the Bible says. The Lord bless and keep you. Let's read verse 11. Instead of that, we read this. And now you are cursed from the ground. If there's no power in the curse, it really didn't matter, did it? But it did matter. And now you're cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Basically, there's two elements here to the curse upon Cain. The ground is going to be unproductive, and you're going to be a fugitive and a wanderer. Cain then makes his protest to God. Verse 13, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Here's how twisted Cain was. He perceived the punishment he received as excessive. That's too much. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. Is he being real? Yeah, that's how twisted sin is. 
The penalty for my sin is too much. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we need to hear before we hear good news, the understanding of the bad news. There are consequences for sin, especially before a holy God. Sin has repercussions. The truth was, God was amazingly lenient with Cain. Genesis 9, 5 and 6 was yet to come. You remember where God instructed that when someone killed a man, he himself was to be put to death. That was to come later, but it certainly tells us of God's attitude to the taking of human life. God's attitude to murder was exactly the same here in Genesis 4. It's, it's revealed in Genesis 9. God is the same. He doesn't change. His attitude to murder was the same. But Cain had no true understanding of justice. He should have faced the death penalty, yet he was living with a beating heart. He just didn't get it. May I ask you, do you get it? The verse in Proverbs, it's very informative along this line. Proverbs 28, 5. Evil men do not understand justice. But those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Do you seek the Lord or is there a heart of evil that does not quite get why God is just when he, be, he actually dispenses justice? You see, it's not a crime for God to dispense justice. You can't stand outside a court and say, we need this judge. We want this judge to be off the bench, no longer functioning. Why? Why? Because he keeps making just decisions. Try that. It's not going to do anything. No, the job of the judge is to be just, and he does not have to show mercy. When the law says this crime deserves 12 years behind bars, He's not unjust when he dispenses that judgment in the court. It's amazing if he says four or three or two, two years rather than 12. But if he just did what the law said, he's done nothing wrong. And when God is just, let's start the sentences again. Since God is just, he will punish, hear this, all sin. Either our sin will be judged on the person in hell forever or on the back of Jesus on the cross. Jesus stood in the place of sinners and took the just judgment of God against them on himself. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement, the punishment that should have been upon us was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. That's the message of the cross. Do you get it? God is just, Romans 3 says, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How can God be just when sinners go free? Because someone stood in their place and took the justice they deserve. God was always just, is always just, always will be just. And in the person of Jesus Christ, sin was judged. All the sins of all those who would ever believe were laid on him. And by his wounds, we're brought back together with God. We're healed. Verse 14, behold, Cain goes on. You've driven me today away from the ground. Cain was expelled. And from your face I shall be hidden. This does not mean he would not be seen by God. But it means God's favor would no longer be looking on him. There would no no longer be any kindness towards him. It's the opposite of the ironic blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. The opposite would be this. The Lord curse you and leave you to your own devices. The Lord make his face to cause you to always be in distress and darkness. And may you always sense his anger and hostility. May his countenance always frown on you and cause you to find only strife and unrest. Ladies and gentlemen, believe me, you don't want that. You don't want that at all. Cain goes on, I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain realized he was condemned to a life of restlessness. And he thought he'd be hunted down. He'd never have a place that was safe, never have a safe haven. Always restless. Always he'd be singing, but I still haven't found 
what I'm looking for. It was Augustine who said, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Where are you? Can you allow yourself to be quiet? Do you always have to have music? Do you always have to have something in the background to still the voice of conscience? The Christian, above all, should be able to say, I have peace with God and my soul is at rest. He said, Whoever finds me will kill me. And I believe Cain's guilty conscience was speaking here. He hadn't heard that from others. But that was his own understanding. His internal warning system was still making some kind of noise. And that conscience is a provision from God. May I ask you, what do you do with your guilty conscience? You might have lived a somewhat righteous life in the eyes of men, but God knows behind the scenes there have been things in your heart at least that would not like to be shown on a big screen with a hundred people watching. God sees it all. All things are laid open and bare to the one with whom we have to do. What do you do with that guilty conscience? Do you humble yourself or do you in pride and arrogance run from God? You can't be neutral on this. You're doing something with your conscience. Your conscience will either drive you back to God or you'll run away from him in pride and in arrogance. Many atheists, after they are converted back to Christ, admit that they ran from God because their conscience made too much noise. Better to deny his existence than be awakened to the voice of conscience. Recognizing his life should have been blotted out, he believed others will kill him. And here's what God could have said. Absolutely, yes, that's right. If someone finds you, they will kill you. That's not what we read. Instead, we read verse 15, Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Oh, what mercy. Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Let's read verses 15 and 16. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. If someone comes against you, they're going to go, they're going to regret it instantly. And the Lord put a mark on Cain. Oh, the volume of literature on this particular phrase. Through the centuries, much hurt and much damage has been done because people with racial bias read this verse and read into it what their evil hearts want to say. Some have said the mark on Cain was that he was made black. Horrendous. What was the mark of Cain? You know what? We don't know. There it is. After much study, we don't know. But some marking of Cain singled him out. If it was that he was black and others became black as well, that wouldn't be a mark, would it? 28 people around him, black, 38, 3,000. Whoa, no, even logically it doesn't work. But there was a special mark put on Cain for the purpose of protection. It was a mercy, not a curse. Even here... God is merciful towards Cain. The Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. It was for merciful purposes. Praise the Lord. God's further mercy towards Cain is seen here with a protection program. You ever heard of that? Protection program. This was God's initiation. An invisible wall of protection would be around Cain. Sevenfold vengeance is declared on anyone who kills him. Cain deserved harsh treatment, and yet God in kindness is seen here, and we're witnessing mercy once again. It's mercy after mercy after mercy. You see, none of us deserve mercy. By its very definition, mercy is undeserved. It's unmerited favor. Remember in Matthew 5, verse 45, Jesus said, God causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, rain to fall on the just and the unjust. That's mercy. You see, if you and I were God and we didn't like someone, 
If we saw a terrorist, we'd cut off his air supply 10 feet around him. God lets many opposers to him live and live long. Some live to be even 100 years old. God is very merciful. We call this common grace, not because it's worth little, but because it's common. Anyone who's living gets it. If you're alive, God is merciful to you. You and I didn't deserve to wake up this morning. Quite a thought. What has God done for me lately? He's holding your brain cells together while you defy him. The mark. We don't know what it was, but it was a merciful sign and it ensured protection for Cain, who deserved the death penalty. Cain's expelled. He's driven out. Where does he go? He goes to the land of Nod, east of Eden. Verse 16, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. That location, Nod, is unknown. All we know about it is the description that follows. It's east of Eden. Verse 17, we read of Cain knowing his wife. Isn't that interesting? It's same as we read earlier in the chapter. Adam knew his wife, Eve. Now Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. By the way, this is not the Enoch who would later walk with God and was not. That would come later. Genesis 5 verse 4 tells us, but we read here of the children. She conceived and bore Enoch, and when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. Verse 18, so to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad fathered, fathered Mahajiel, and Mahajiel fathered Methusiel, and Methusiel fathered Lamech. Big question. I know you come to church hoping I deal with it, where did Cain get his wife? Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis once said he gets more questions about Cain's wife than his own. <laughs> so he wrote a little book, Where Did Cain Get His Wife, to answer that question. But for some it's a big deal because we don't read where Cain got his wife. But the obvious answer in Scripture is immediately apparent. The answer is Cain married his sister. Uh, we're told in Genesis 1, 28, that Adam and Eve were to uh, be fruitful and multiply. And Genesis chapter 5, verse 4 tells us they had other sons and daughters. Now, how do we get around this? Well, we don't. Uh, thank you. Interlude. Interlude. <laughs> It's interesting. wonder what else is going to fall out from here. <laughs> later, in later centuries, there are laws forbidding close relatives to marry. But that was centuries later. Cain was in the first generation of children ever born and would have had virtually no imperfect genes at this point from his parents. By Moses' time, centuries later, Degenerative issues would have accumulated so that the law became necessary. And you can read of that in Genesis 18 through to chapter 20. Remember, then, in the time of Leviticus and Moses, there were now a vast number of people. That was not the case when Cain married his sister. And it was necessary for him to marry a close relative. And think about it, all of us, if we go back, and since we go back to Adam and Eve, are only marrying... Close relatives. Think about it. We go all the way back to the first couple. As I say, Enoch, I think I said Genesis 5.4 for Enoch. Genesis 5.18 is the verse that tells us uh, the later Enoch. Verse 17 continues. Cain, <coughs> then it says in verse 17, knew his wife, <coughs> she conceived, and bore Enoch, and when he, that's Enoch, built a city, he called the name of the city after his son Enoch. When he. So Cain built the city and named it Enoch after his son. I'm not sure if I was getting a little confused there. 
Cain built the city, named it Enoch after his son. And what we have here, what I'm not confused about, is the emergence of civilization. Witness here the advancement of civilization, the advancement of sin in defiance of God and his ways. Would you say that that's true in our own day? With all our sophistication, with all of our technological advances, are we any closer to God or further away? What we read of here is very interesting regarding uh, the professions of those who came. Verse 20, Adar bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and heart and pipe. What we read here is instruments being forged. What we read here is interesting regarding his history, where things came from. Verse 22, Zilla also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And then we have this major boast of Lamech. He says to his wives, 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 plural, that's the first of its kind, polygamy. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. Wives of Lamech, he's speaking in the third person. He speaks so boastfully. What does he say? I've killed a man for wounding me a young man for striking me. There's a familiar ring to this kind of boast. And again, this is Cain's line in view here. Pride reeks coming out from the pages of our Bible. Oh, the pride here. He had such a high view of himself. He was self-important. He had a major inflated ego. He was a self-made man who worshipped his maker. Think about that. This is an outlandish statement. Someone wounds him, and he overreacts and kills him, and in pride, not only does he do this, but he boasts about it to his wives. This is defiance. I'm going to marry as many people as I want. I'm not going to listen to God. I'm going to do my thing, and if someone comes against me, they're going to really pay. What did he say? If Cain's revenge, verse 24, is sevenfold, Lamax is 77-fold. They're going to wish they never mess with me. This is outlandish. If someone wounds you, there's no need to kill them. But Lamax had such a high view of himself, anything goes. First Peter 5.5 5 tells us instead, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due season. It also says, he sets himself against the proud but gives grace to the humble. God sets himself in battle array in opposition to the proud. Believe me, you don't want that. But what we're reading of here is, here is generations, civilizations are quickly being formed. And verse 19 through 24 reveals like a stream which at the top is kind of pure, close to pure. By the time it reaches river status, it's polluted. It's no longer a blessing. And the blessing that was there in the first family is far, far away as the corruption takes more and more of a foothold in the human race. Lamach was seven generations from Adam, six from Cain, and his influence, the influence of Cain was now being seen in Lamech, where we have this grotesque, gross boasting. It was passed down, it was passed on. He had two wives, and he went against God's original intent and design. And now this family is all at odds. There'd be nomads, there'd be a lifestyle of Moving from place to pay, place, Jabal invented musical instruments, the lyre, which speaks of a stringed instrument, the pipe, which speaks of a wind instrument. And yet in all this, they gave no attention and thanks to God. And Romans chapter 1 describes the downward spiral of the human race as they refuse to glorify God or be thankful 
1 Corinthians 4, 7 puts it this way, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Think of anything that's a blessing in your life, the clothes you're wearing, the food you will eat today, the sleep that you might have got last night, any of it and all of it is God's gift. God gives his beloved sleep. It's not our right. God gives us breath. It's not our right. We don't have a right to a beating heart. We don't have a right to a brain that still functions, even though it may not function as it once did. But what do you have that you didn't receive? But Lamech has nothing for that. He's just all about himself. Well, this is an encouraging sermon so far, right? But there is a but. Look at verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, like a bookend to end the chapter as it had in the beginning. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed. The, the name Seth sounds like the Hebrew word for appointed. God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So Seth also was a son born, and his name, he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, here we have, after much, much darkness, just a little bit of light coming into view. After so much hope is taken away, now we have hope. Seth means appointed, and God has appointed Seth as the one who will be the line of the righteous. This righteous line is being established that now that Abel has gone, Seth is his replacement, and he would have a righteous influence. There's this flicker of light amidst the darkness. The theme of the Protestant Reformation, post tenebras lux, after darkness, light. I don't know what the story is of you and your family, but perhaps it's been the case that there's been much, much darkness, not only in your generation, but in previous generations. Think of a house where no one has trod, no one has set foot for decades, and boy, is it dark. The good news is you don't have to vacuum the darkness out. Just turn the light on. And the entrance of God's Word gives light. And perhaps it is the case that for you, God has made a change in your life so that now there is light in your family. It has been dark. There's been a, a, a history of people caught up in false religion and false theories about God, and now you've got access to the truth and you're reading your Bible. How gracious God is in giving you that light. Now you see it, and now you can make a change. It doesn't have to be. Your children doesn't have to be the way previous generations ended up. They can be people that serve God. Thank God, there's always hope. God steps in. And to Adam and Eve, Seth was born. And look at the result. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. This was a turning point. We've re read of darkness upon darkness and spiral upon spiral, down and down, down and down we go. But suddenly God steps in and says, but that's not the end. I am raising up a remnant. I'm raising up a people who will want me. God starts the process, and it becomes a turning point. Do you realize this? God often works his best works in the midst of chaos. We only have to go back a few chapters and read of Genesis chapter 1. All was in darkness, all was void. Was it all over? No. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Perhaps this day God is saying, Light shine in your heart, and it's a turning point for your generation and those who come after you. What an answer to prayer that would be. Ladies and gentlemen, there was light after the darkness. And the light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ shines in your heart, and you'll be able to see what people could not see before. Oftentimes when people tell of a conversion story, those who are at work say, oh, you've seen the light, have you? Oh yeah, you've seen the light. But in all reality, that's what's happened. 
2 Corinthians 4 tells us the light has shined just as at creation. It shined in your heart and you can now see the value and the worth and the treasure of Jesus. And you think he's not only worth living for, he's worth dying for. This treasure is beyond all earthly treasure. He's not just a name in a book. He's not just a historical figure. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, this same Lord Jesus has stepped into your heart so that you realize he's real, he's alive, he's worth living for, dying for, and he's going to come back again. And people around you say, whoa, what's happened to you? I've seen the light. Yes, I've seen the light. God shined his light in my heart. What a miracle. I pray it happens in your life so that today you value the gospel story more than any other story. It's the story you want to tell your kids. It's what you, tell you, what you want to tell your grandchildren. God so loved this world that he stepped into time, became a man, living an absolutely pure and flawless life, obeying his Father always, keeping the law's demands, the laws that he himself wrote. And on the cross, he died in the place of lawbreakers and rose again from the dead three days later and is this, at this moment in the place of supreme authority in the universe. And God allows you to see it because light has come after much darkness. My prayer is that you'll understand this Christ and repent and not going the way of Cain. Come to him on his terms by means of the sacrifice already made for you, the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We can get from Genesis 4 to the cross of Jesus Christ and see that the same message is in view. God saves by the death of someone who laid his life down in their place. This Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have you seen him? Have your eyes been opened to see him and see his treasure, his worth, his value? If you can see it, God has been very merciful to you. My prayer is that you call upon the name of the Lord as the people did in that day and be saved. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your supremacy and your mastery in a world of darkness. May we look to this Christ, the Savior, the God-man, Jesus Christ, and be saved and live in the strength of relationship with him. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.